Hello and welcome to the May UN Info session. I'm Alex, an intern with the San Diego chapter of the United Nations Association. The San Diego chapter was founded in 1946 to promote local engagement with the United Nations, and it's one of the oldest, most active chapters within the United States. Surely since the start of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, you've heard about how the virus particularly impacts older adults. Um, today we'll be discussing uh, some of the many challenges that older adults are confronted with, and we are lucky enough to be joined by Paul Downey, the President and CEO of Serving Seniors. Yesterday was a big day for San Diego County because it marked Paul's 25th anniversary with Serving Seniors and 25 years of advocating for our forgotten older adults, so thank you, Paul. Well, I just thank everybody for the, the tremendous support that I've had and, and guidance and, and uh, tremendous support from the community. Great, great. So would you mind starting off by telling us how you got involved with Serving Seniors and what the organization is? Sure. Well, Serving Seniors, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, this is actually our 50th year in operation, and we provide safety net services for low-income seniors. Uh, the average um, income for our, our folks is under $1,000 a month. Uh, median income is about $935. Uh, the federal poverty level is 1,063. So uh, significantly under the federal poverty level, um, struggling to find housing. Um, and so we, we provide a whole series of core support services, things like housing, uh, case management, uh, activities, access to health care, uh, through collaborative partners, access to dental care, uh, mental health care, and of course meals is, is really the centerpiece of what we do, uh, breakfast and lunch seven days a week. I actually got involved um, as a volunteer. Uh, I've been a CEO for 25 years, but I had volunteered uh, for about uh, almost seven years uh, when I was a member of the mayor's staff. Uh, we would come and serve lunch once a month, and I kind of got hooked, got uh, enticed, into uh, the whole, a whole world that I, I didn't, I frankly knew very little about. I mean, I had older adults in my life, but I really didn't know, uh, you know much about the issues and just kind of gradually got, uh, got pulled in. And uh, once the mayor's term ended, I had an opportunity to become CEO and quarter century later, here I am. <laughs> Great, well, I'm glad that you got so involved. You provide so many important things for our community and our older adults. And so I'm curious what you think the number one reason is that people go and seek your services. Well, it's a combination of things. Uh, because of the poverty, uh, you know, 85% being below federal poverty, um, you know, one of the great motivators is, is need. Uh, that uh, need of a meal. Uh, uh, you know, when you look at uh, the typical, uh, that income of 935, uh, rents even for a single room occupancy hotel, in San Diego, which is kind of the cheapest market rate housing out there, is 750, 800. So you can do the arithmetic on what folks are, are living on. So that desire and need for meals is, is, is a major driver. But there's also a, a need, I think, for the social aspect of coming to one of our senior centers uh, to see folks, to participate in activities, uh, and to you know, and to interact uh, and, and have a place where, where people know you and you are um, active and able to be, uh, be, be known, but also to receive the, the help and, that, that you need. Um, you know, for our homebound uh, seniors who receive uh, meals delivered, a lot of that is because they are uh, either have physical issues or mental health issues or both, and are not able to get out and get to one of the senior centers or be able to get the meal. So there's a lot of drivers for it, and a lot of reasons that people want to to get involved, uh, but it, a lot of it also just boils down to, again, that sense of, of belonging somewhere. Uh, you know, in some respects, we're all still creatures of second grade of wanting to be you know, part of the cool kids uh, group, and it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I remember I was lucky enough to visit the Gary and Mary West Center, and I remember you explained that there's also a safety component because people are able to go a certain place every day. There are people who check up on them. Well, and that's right. That, that, that's, that's something that's very important. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's as much as a motivator for them, but from our standpoint as a staff, um, having somebody come in every day and, you know, under normal circumstances, we'd be operating seven days 
a week at our, at our Gary and Mary West Senior Wellness Center, uh, our housing facilities, of course, but it's that seems people on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's the same phenomenon that we see with our drivers. Uh, so we use paid drivers, for instance, to deliver our meals into the, the, the older adults' homes. And we do that so that, the, just what you said, the same set of eyes are on them. So that if, if I'm delivering a meal to you and you know, today your hair is combed, you're dressed, you're cognate, you know, with it from a cognitive standpoint, and we come tomorrow and you're disheveled, uh, maybe not dressed and, and, not, and seeming off, that we're allowed, we see that and we're able to intervene, hopefully intervene at an earlier stage. Uh, than having to call 911 and rush to the hospital. So the idea is that this kind of an early warning system, being able to see people interact, see if there's a change in their appearance or their affect, and get services quickly, um, again, before the crisis occurs. Great, great. So a couple times now you mentioned how your clients rank uh, in comparison to the federal poverty level. And I'm also familiar with the um, elder index. So I'm wondering if you could explain what those two metrics are, how they compare, and what the policy implications of the two are. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I think most people have heard of the federal poverty level. It's how the government, governments, really at all levels, it's, it started with the federal government, how they measure poverty in this country. And it's a one-size-fits-all. Uh, so the federal poverty level um, is about $1,063 um, this year. And that's the same federal poverty here in San Diego or New York City or Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and it's the same if you live in an urban area, a rural area. Um, so it's a one size fits all. And it was actually developed, it's sort of interesting that people may think that there's some sort of complicated mechanism for how it was developed, uh, but it actually dates back to 1964. And in 1964, President Lyndon Johnson had launched his war on poverty in the United States. And he needed some sort of measurement for uh, what the poverty level was and to show progress against that, that measurement. So there was a woman by the name of Molly Oshansky who worked for the Social Services Administration. She was tasked with coming up with a federal poverty rate. And so what she did is she pulled data from 1955 and found that the average American family spent one third of their income on food. And so she said, okay, I'm gonna multiply that by three and created the federal poverty level. Full stop, that's how it was created. It essentially is based on uh, questionable methodology from 1964, based on data from 1955, and it's exactly the same federal poverty level that we use today. The only thing that happens is it is adjusted on an annual basis by the consumer price index. So it's a one size fits all, questionable methodology. It doesn't take into account things like healthcare and transportation and housing and other, other costs. But that's how we measure virtually every poverty program in this country by an artificial number. So, uh, it's, and so this year is a little more than $12,000 a year um, is what the federal poverty level says. If you're above that, if you're above 12,000 and change, you are not poor. If you're below that, um, you're poor and qualified for, for extra services. So along came the, the, what I call the Elder Economic Security Initiative or better known as the Elder Index. And it was started a, a number of years ago by uh, folks in, uh, Massachusetts, though, they focused on uh, folks that were looked at, looking at things like healthcare, looking at things like uh, transportation, housing costs. And so that has now evolved across the country. And what's happened uh, here in California is that UC UCLA Center for Health Policy Research um, uh, a number of years ago started looking at what actual hard costs were for those things. So we're talking about food, healthcare, transportation, and housing. And said, what does a senior need on a county by county basis in order to uh, address those things? And so what they came up with is a much better mechanism to, to, measure, uh, to measure that. And so, uh, for instance, in San Diego, 
the elder index is a little bit over $24,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And so you can see it's, it's about twice what the federal poverty level is. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is we have this whole gap of, of between what the government says you're in poverty and what the real number is of economic insecurity yeah. by almost $12. So in San Diego, that means that basically two out of five uh, older adults falls below the elder index, which means they don't have enough money to meet their basic needs. And uh, in California, that's almost one in two. And so from a policy standpoint, we have this big disconnect between what the government says we're dealing with in poverty and what the real number is, which is, is just about twice as many, many folks are falling under the poverty, or under the economically insecure is a better way to phrase it. Yeah, wow. Well, thank goodness there are organizations like Serving Seniors to fill some of those gaps. Um, so I'm curious how uh, COVID-19 is particularly impacting your clients and what Serving Seniors is doing for them in this time. Well, there's, there's um, a number of things that, were, that, are, that are impacting them. I mean, of course, um, the majority of our folks are 65 plus, which is uh, considered to be one of the higher risk groups uh, out there uh, uh, you know, because of age. And many of them have multiple chronic health conditions. So they are, you know, they are at risk, uh, more at risk uh, than, than younger uh, and perhaps healthier populations. Um, but then it's, it's the, the having to shelter in place. Uh, so for, for many of them coming to one, like one of our senior centers, um, you know, we have 11 sites throughout San Diego County from Oceanside to San Ysidro and out east to Ramona. And so coming to our senior centers was a big part of their day uh, where they could get meals, they could get access to the services that we talked about a couple of minutes ago and, and also to see their friends. And that was their social environment because most of them live alone. Over 80, in fact, over 80% of our clients live alone. And so that was a place for them to be able to come and, and hang out and, and see folks. Now they're being told, you know, you need to shelter in place, which is, is good advice. It's the wise thing to do, but they can't interact. And because of the poverty, uh, a lot of them don't have smartphones. Mm -hmm. uh, we're able to, to get them help, get them, you know, flip phones so they can you know, use it as a telephone, but they're not able to use it to do things like FaceTime or Zoom or, uh, or frankly, even be able to keep up with what's going on uh, as much in the news. So you know, one of the impacts that we're seeing, in addition to, to making sure they get things like food and toiletries and their medications, is information. Um, quite often we're finding with our as, our, as our social workers and nurses and staff are, are interacting, they are finding that people have misinformation you know, because their neighbor's neighbor's son came up with some bizarre uh, you know, rumor or, or about what was going on, they often had misinformation. And so we're spending a lot of time having to educate folks mm -hmm. um, as to what's really going on. And that you, you, you need to take this seriously. I mean, I'll give you, you know, a, a perfect example. A couple days ago, I was um, at our Potiker family senior residence downtown, a 200 unit complex uh, at 14th and Market. And I had my mask on and actually had gloves on. And I encountered um, one of the older adults who lives there, who I know well, a guy named Mario. And Mario had just come in uh, from outside, did not have a mask, did not have a gloves, bypassed the hand washing station. And you know, I gently kind of chided him and said, hey Mario, you, know, you gotta wash your hands, you gotta wear your mask. And he said, well, you know, a, a friend of mine told me that because I get out and I walk 10,000 steps every day and I take my vitamins, that I'm not gonna get it. And this is a smart guy. I mean, he, yeah. uh, he had misinformation. And so, you know, I tried, I don't know if I was successful, but I tried to explain to him that, you know, you need to take precautions and it's great that you're walking and it's great you're taking your vitamins, but that isn't gonna protect you if you encounter somebody who is COVID-19 positive. And so uh, a lot of the impact has been has been that, and, and, and then the big impact of social isolation. 
And that, that is a, a, a area of deep concern. Hmm. Yeah, and I can imagine how difficult it must be to educate people who also suffer from memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's. Well, that's, that's, that's a big issue because they're not able to necessarily, I mean, they can't see their friends, they can't interact with their families, or they may have grandchildren that they can't see. Um, they don't have, and, and for a lot of them, um, who, particularly folks who you know, isolated living alone, uh, part of their day was structured around you know, going to the bank, going to the grocery store, maybe stopping by the dry cleaner, hopefully maybe going to the senior center, but that's where a lot of the interaction for them would be. They would structure their day around things that we might consider to be just errands that are just a small part of, of what we're doing during the course of the day. These folks, it becomes uh, you know, a key part of, um, of that social that social environment and, and things to keep them sharp. So one of the things we've done is we've launched uh, something called the Serving Seniors Connections Program, where we're connecting uh, volunteers who are making friendly calls uh, to our homebound seniors. I say friendly calls and that is not intended to be to replace the case management and support services that our, our social workers, nurses, and mental health folks are doing. But just to have somebody to check in with them, and whether it's talking about the weather, uh, whatever, whatever topics that they, that they want to discuss, and to have some interactions. And so uh, this has been successful and it's growing, uh, but it's a way to reach out. Um, we would like to do more, uh, but again, the challenge becomes because of the poverty level of our clients, we, we can't use technology like Zoom or FaceTime or some things that you know, would be a little more advanced and be able to be a little bit more creative on, on things, unfortunately, uh, because, of, uh, because of some of the limitations. And a lot of them don't have access to things like, you know, like, like Wi-Fi. Um, but I, but, I, but the, the social isolation is a, is a really big deal because it was an issue pre-COVID-19. I mean, a lot of older adults are isolated, um, lonely, uh, and that could, could cause you know, mental health issues and depression, which can lead into issues, physical issues as well. And so um, now we've got people who work vibrant, active in the community, out and about doing things, who can't do that any longer because they are now housebound and not able to interact. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the long-term impacts. I, I was chatting with, every week I, I have a, a Zoom call with all of our drivers who are out delivering meals just to check in, see how things are going with them. And anecdotally, they started, they were sharing with me that they are seeing physical deterioration in the folks that are, are uh, homebound uh, because we, we had to transition people who were coming to our senior centers to receive the meals uh, home, homebound, but not being able to get out, not being able to get fresh air, get some exercise, interact, and you're seeing that they're seeing the physical deterioration, and uh, that's something that I think is I, th I think there's going to be a long-term residual impact from this, just beyond the obvious health issues. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's tough to hear, but um, I guess I'm glad that there is a space for them to meet when it's healthy to do so, and hopefully afterwards everyone will resume, you know, being able to go out and about and mingle at the serving senior centers once again. Um, so taking a step back from just the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm curious, like, what is ageism and what does it look like? Well, ageism is, uh, is unfortunately, I think one of the isms that is still tolerated uh, in this country. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we, we're, we are making progress with things with sexism and racism. I mean, there's still ways to go in, in those areas, but there is progress and things that might have been tolerated 20, 25 years ago are not tolerated now. But with ageism, it is, it is tolerated. And, and that is basically you know, depictions of, of, of older adults in an unflattering way. Um, I, can give you, I can give you an example just from this morning. I was listening to NPR, so NPR, and there was a show uh, where the host was interviewing uh, NPR's White House correspondent and congressional correspondent. And they were talking about the impacts of trying to cover news in the COVID-19 
era. And uh, the correspondent, the congressional correspondent was saying that she, you know, was not going up to Capitol Hill to cover, you know, because there was great risk of uh, COVID you know, being, being transmitted and then said something about how, yeah, it was, you know, especially given uh, who the members of Congress are. And all three of them started laughing. Uh, because the implication being, of course, that these are, you know, largely older adults and are senators and members of, of the House. And they started saying, oh, yeah, because of the age. And it was uproariously funny for, for, you know, for 45 seconds laughing about, about age being the, the issue. And then they said, oh, well, we better be careful. We don't want to be ageist. So as somebody, it's the same type of thing is somebody who makes a racist or sexist comment and then says, but of course I'm not, I'm not racist or I'm not sexist. And so it's just little things like that, that, you know, it's sort of okay to, to sort of laugh that, um, you know, the older adults are more susceptible to uh, having bad outcomes from it. And so it's just little things. I mean, other examples, I mean, you know, if, if uh, Hallmark cards was open and you wanted to go buy a birthday card for anybody over 40, What's the gist of the cards? It's all over the hill geezers. I mean, on TV shows, um, sitcoms, you, you turn on a, a sitcom. Older adults are portrayed often as crotchety, inappropriate, hard of hearing. Um, and it, and you know, people sort of laugh and, and, and make jokes about it. And uh, you know, it's very unfortunate because what that translates also though is into how people perceive older adults. Um, it, so it isn't just sort of making fun of, it's if somebody sees somebody with a cane or maybe with a hearing aid, um, they immediately start thinking, oh, that, that anybody who has a hearing aid or, or a cane must be, uh, must be senile, must have Alzheimer's, must have dementia. Um, I mean, they make, they make assumptions, um, you know, based or based on gray hair or, uh, and, um, and again, I can give you, you know, a, a, a perfect example of, of this. Uh, one of my mentors was a woman by the name of Anda Mills Myers. Uh, she was a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, she passed away at almost 90 last year. And uh, I remember her telling me that she said, you know, when I was younger, you know, when I was young, I would walk into a room and I would attract attention because I was attractive and outgoing and people would pay attention to me. She said as I started to grow into my mid career, middle age, you know, I, she was became a very senior official at the county of San Diego. I'd walk into a room and people would pay attention to me because of my position and what, you know, my, my job and, and what I knew. And then, you know, just before I retired, I, I was a very senior level and so people definitely paid attention to me. And then I retired. And I would walk into a room and she said, now I was just an old woman who nobody paid attention to. Yeah. Despite the fact that for organizations like us, she was an incredibly valuable resource um, as a mentor to me and to our social workers for a good 20 years after she retired, uh, continued to provide advice to us and still had a lot to contribute. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's just how we perceive people. Um, yeah. I can give you another, another example. Um, this is a personal one for me. Um, last year, I, I suffered a severe knee injury. I mean, so it was a long recovery. And for uh, uh, quite a few months, I mean, I needed to use a cane. And I noticed, it was, and my wife noticed it as well, um, you know, going to restaurants and suddenly I was, the, you know, waitress or waiter was, I was, I was honey. I was, and at times people, or I would go to, we would go to interact with somebody and people would start talking to my wife as if I wasn't there, but I was, uh, you know, I had a cane, and so I must somehow be infirm, um, mm -hmm. you know, mentally challenges because I needed to use a cane. And those are the types of things that we, we, we see with, with, with ageism, is that just the subconscious, um, and, 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 frankly, and, and ageism, I, I should also add, can be, isn't just for older adults. Um, I mean, you know, younger, younger folks, um, I mean, there, you know, there are some, you know, that would look at millennials and say, okay, well, stereotype millennials are a certain way. 
um, baby boomers are a certain way. And, you know, we just need to avoid that trap of saying everybody is, is kind of falls into the same category based on, on their age. Yeah, I think that's all very well said. And I agree that these, you know, these depictions of elders really devalue them and all of the free services they so often provide after retirement, including perspective, wisdom, volunteering, um, consulting for your organization, child care, grandchild care. So that's really important to address. Um, now I'm wondering if you could speak to the lack of affordable senior housing with supportive services and what should be done about that. Sure. Well, that's that the lack of affordable housing is, in my view, is actually the number one issue related to, to aging. Uh, what we find in a, in a place like San Diego, uh, the median rents are now about $2,100 a month. So let's go back to uh, you know, the in, median income for clients like ours, $900 and $35. Um, even if somebody is at the elder index, again, 24,000, so let's say 2,000 a month, um, their, their median income is less than the median rent. Um, so you, assuming you can find a, a, cheaper, a cheaper spot, um, you don't have much left over. And so uh, in San Diego, we see waiting lists for affordable housing complexes of seven or eight years if you want to get into a HUD building. Uh, to get a Section 8 voucher in San Diego is 11 years uh, from the Housing Commission. Um, I'll give you a, a first-hand example. Um, last year, uh, serving seniors opened our Smalley Family Senior Residence in Ramona. And there we have 62 units. And we had over 3,000 people on the waiting list to get in. Um, I mean, right. The, the, the reality is, of those 3,000, 2,900, uh, you know, are not going to get in. Yeah. <laughs> reality, we have, you know, we have 62 people um, who are in, and I mean, I think we, since we've been open, I mean, we have we're averaging less than one unit turnover a month. So the reality is, most of those folks will not get in, and you know, I point out, I mean, in Ramona is a beautiful community, but it's an hour away from San Diego. So folks were willing to move away from San Diego, move to Ramona uh, and in search of affordable housing. Um, we can't build units fast enough uh, mm -hmm. to meet the need. And, and again, it's all about you know, it's supply and demand. The, the supply is short, demand is high uh, in market rate and in affordable. And what that does is create this, this huge issue because folks are spending sometimes 75, 80% of their income on rent and literally left with maybe six or $7 a day for everything else. And it just, just, just doesn't work. It, 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 and it puts them on the cusp of, of homelessness. You know, I think for, for probably most of us, I mean, it would take a horrific series of catastrophic events to end up homeless. I mean, we've got safety nets, we've got family, we've got friends. Uh, you know, it, 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 it may not, it probably wouldn't happen. But for a lot of older adults, um, they are just right on the brink. It just takes a small little blip and they are over the edge um, into homelessness. And, and in San Diego, a third of the uh, people on the streets are now older adults um, and it's growing. And, and San Diego is actually not as bad as Los Angeles and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. San Francisco, the number of older adults is approaching 50%. Uh, Los Angeles is about 42, 43% of the homeless on the streets are older adults. So it's a growing cohort um, and something that, that needs to be needs to be addressed because the needs of older adult homeless or unsheltered um, are different than younger homeless. And there's, a, there's a distinct difference. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine maybe more medical care, more, what would you characterize well, the difference as? Well, the difference, yes. I mean, I think that, that well, there, there's a couple of things that, that we've seen. A lot of the older adults that we're seeing, it, they are economically homeless. Mm. Um, 
that basically, um, a, a couple of reasons, loss of job, you know, maybe late 50s, or early 60s, loss of a job, can't get reemployed or can't get reemployed to a job at the same salary level. And this is sort of pre-COVID. COVID throws a whole other wrinkle into this. Or a spouse gets sick. Uh, and so there's a life, life savings uh, suddenly goes to take care of the ill spouse. And then the survivor who you know, thought that they had life savings to, for retirement now doesn't have it. And they, they could be in their early, mid 60s. I mean, you know, with a, hopefully a lot of years to go. And suddenly um, they only have social security as their, their sole safety net. And you see this, you can see this spiral as people max out their credit cards, uh, they, then they lose their, they move into their car, they lose their car, and they end up homeless. So those folks, there is high motivation to not be homeless. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a little bit of advantage as we work with them because you're not dealing with some of the mental health issues or substance abuse issues that you might see with some other populations out there. It's not to say that we don't see folks with those, but it is a smaller percentage than we see with, you may see with other younger population. The other thing as you get to, as you, as you alluded to, Alex, is that the, with the older adults, you have more medical issues, chronic conditions, but you also have the, the situation is that it's unlikely that somebody who's 75 or 80 years old is going, you know, you're going to work to rehab them to go back to work, which is a lot of what happens with, with younger populations is the whole goal is to get them um, going back to work, you know, to get them to deal with whatever mental health, substance abuse, whatever issues are going on, get them some job training, go back and become you know, productive working members of the community. Mm -hmm. they, that's not going to happen with an older adult. So got to figure out with the resources that come with them, which is basically Social Security, SSI, how you uh, find a place for them to live, which alludes back to the question we, we talked about a couple minutes ago about affordable housing, is it gets very difficult and they're on a very fine margin and their circumstances aren't going to change. Yeah. Um, unless they hit the lottery, their, sort of, their, their economic situation is going to be what it is till they pass away. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I think a lot about how uh, traditional homeless rehabilitation programs focus on employment and how many older adults aren't able to be employed in the same way. So we need new solutions to that issue. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, you also spoke to the fact that uh, at times 75 to 80% of uh, income goes straight into rent and so that leaves people with very little to support their health and nutrition and so i'm wondering if you could elaborate on the importance of senior nutrition to their overall physical and mental health sure well, well we all know i mean you know our mothers always told us you know eat your peas eat you know eat you know eat eat well eat you know, nutritious food and there's and studies show that, that there's our mothers were right um, i guess it's appropriate with mother's day tomorrow that, that our mothers were right about Eating, eating nutritious food. I mean, we, we know that, um, and this is particularly so with older adults and or people who have some sort of chronic health conditions, that the food can be as important as taking their medications to keep them healthy and well. Um, so it isn't, it, it isn't just access to food of any sort. Um, it's, it is nutritious food in the proper quantities, uh, proper number of calories, making sure they're getting their, their proper, proper nutrients. And also, particularly in a senior center uh, setting, uh, it's coming and, and dealing with some of the social issues we, we talked about earlier. Um, so it's, it's the social aspect of sharing a meal with others is very important to somebody's mental health. The food obviously is important to their physical health, uh, but by doing both, uh, both of those things, uh, it, it keeps them, keeps them well. Um, and so we know that we provide two meals a day, breakfast and lunch, uh, that are vetted by uh, uh, dietitians to make sure that they are, they're, 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 they're proper for folks. Um, and we know that that's what keeps them, that's really important to keeping them 
well because our 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 goal is to keep people out of institutional settings. Mm -hmm. uh, preventative you know, care. Preventative care. I mean, there's, a, there, there's nobody, I expect there's nobody on this, on this meeting here who aspires to live out their days in a skilled nursing facility. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is to keep people healthy, provide them housing, and allow them to remain at home um, until they pass away. Yeah. Uh, so as opposed to a skilled nursing facility or an emergency room or ICU, and food is the core to all of that. Is, is making sure that they're getting the proper nutrition. Yeah, great. So why is it that you think elders tend to be so overlooked by development policy or discourse? I think they're taken for granted in a, in a lot of cases, um, and that there's there's a lot of politicians, and this is, this is on both sides of the aisle, who, you know, if, if, when you talk to them about older adults or seniors, um, you know, they'll get a little tear in their eye and they'll talk about their grandmother and how important she was to them and all that. But when, and that's great, that's wonderful, or they'll talk about the greatest generation and certainly, you know, those folks deserve credit as well. But when you ask them, okay, so what specifically have you done? Mm -hmm. older adults there there's there's a little bit of there can be a lot of fumbling about coming up with a good answer uh, because we need to be building policy now that addresses the fact that we are going to almost double the population of older adults in this country over the next 20 to 25 years um, that's just projecting almost 90 million americans by 2050 are going to be over the age of 65. Um, and that's almost a quarter of the entire population that is being projected. And so we know that we are not dealing with the needs now. We know things like Social Security and Medicare are in financial trouble. Um, we know that we are building up humongous debt for a whole lot of reasons, and not necessarily really just for the older adults. And the question is, how do we keep people healthy? How do we keep them out of institutional settings, which is a very, in addition to nobody wanting to be there, it's very expensive. But how do we set up a situation from a policy standpoint so that, um, you know, today's younger generations, I, I mean, are going to end up with the bill? Yeah. And that's, that is a, an enormous, an enormous issue. And so we need to figure out how do we proactively address the fact that, that we're going to have this large cohort and the, the fastest growing segment of this large cohort. And I, and, I, and I should point out when we talk about aging, you know, depending on who you talk to, you know, somewhere 60 ish is sort of the considered to be you know, as you move into being, you know, sort of an older adult, though ARP would say 50 you are, but people can live to 100. So you've got a 40, you know, 30, 40 years where you are considered an older adult. And there's a big difference between a healthy 60 year old and a, even a healthy 85 year old or a 90 year old and the amount of care that's gonna be needed. So issues like caregiving, housing, nutrition are all challenges that we, we need to be addressing from a policy standpoint. The flip side, the po positive, there's a, real, there, there's a big positive here as well, which is we have this cohort that has incredible life experience and wisdom. Yeah. And how, how, as a society, do we tap into that? I mean, historically, uh, we kind of approach retirement that, you know, you hit 65, uh, you get a pat on the back, you get a gold watch, and, you know, off you go and, and uh, play shuffleboard and whatever else you're going to do. But that notion is changing, that people still want to be vibrant and active and, and engaged in the community long beyond 65. But it's how do we tap into that and keep those, folk, those folks engaged? Not, not necessarily working. I mean, they may not want to work a regular Monday through Friday, 40 hour plus job, but how do we tap into them and use that as a resource? So there's challenges, but there's also opportunity. And, and, and right now, uh, frankly, 
you know, in, in Washington and in Sacramento and in most state capitals across this country, you know, we're not doing any particularly good job. We give lip service to it. You know, there's some factions that, that do a good job of scaring older adults uh, and getting them to hopefully, for their perspective, vote a certain way. But when it comes down to what they're actually doing, um, it's really not much. Yeah. Yeah, I think that a lot of what you just said speaks to the importance of building intergenerational connections so that you can, you know, develop that appreciation for older adults and see how we can um, tap into their immense reservoirs of wisdom. So I'm, my final question is how can we all best support um, the elders in our communities? Well, well I think you, you, you touched on something really important, which is this intergenerational. And I think it's, and, I, and this, this gets also gets back to the in, indirectly related to the, the, the ageism issue, and that is that we all need to recognize that we can learn from each other. And so I think there, again, is there, there's, there's tremendous wisdom and experience that older adults have that can share with younger generations, but it also is, is vice versa, that older adults can learn a lot from younger generations who bring new perspectives, different ways of looking at things, um, you know, have been raised in a different environment than, than an older adult may have, and there are things that can be learned. Uh, as well, cross-generationally. So it isn't just a one-way uh, passing of information, it's a two-way passing of information. Um, what I, you know, when I, when I say about how people can be involved, it's, it's it, I, I call it the, you know, it's, it's the lessons we all learned from Mr. Rogers, which is to be a good neighbor, and particularly right now. Yeah. Um, it's, if you have an older adult who is a neighbor of yours, you know, go check on them. You know, knock on the door. I mean, wear your mask, gloves, social distance, but nothing says you can't knock on the door, take a couple of steps back, and just check on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you need toiletries? Do you need me to can I pick up your medication for you? Do you have enough to eat? Um, and if they have all those things, again, you can stand and talk about the weather for 10 minutes with them, but just interact and, and give them some, some, some human contact. You can or you can leave a note on their door saying, hey, my, I, I live down the street, here's my phone number, give me a call, I would love to, I would love to chat with you. Um, I think it's, it's learning to overcome, you know, are some ageist tendencies and that, that, that the next time you see somebody who has a hearing aid or uses a walker or a cane, don't immediately assume that they have dementia. You know, those things don't necessarily go together, um, and that even if you do encounter somebody who's exhibiting some of those symptoms, um, you know, they, they still have, they still might have some uh, amount of cognitive ability and to interact with them and respect that, that ability that they, that they have and, and not be afraid to, you know, also to help out where, where, where you can. And um, so, as I say, I think it's just, it, a lot of it's just being, a good neighbor. Um, I mean, that's how I mean, you, you asked, you know, how I got involved. Um, as I said, I knew very little about aging when I started volunteering. And that's what fascinated me was just interacting with people who had, who had lived history that I only knew about from history books and just life, life experiences. And when you, you, know, you talk to an older adult and you know, by the time somebody's hit 65, 70, 75 years old, a lot of stuff has happened to them, you know, good and bad. And just having somebody in your life who can you know, share, share some of that um, is, is important. Yeah, and that perspective certainly can help us get through this current pandemic because a lot of our grandparents have lived through things as challenging as World War II, polio, the AIDS epidemic, et cetera. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering all of those questions. We'll dive into some audience questions in a bit if people want to start typing some of their extra thoughts into the chat. Um, I'm just going to spend a moment to connect uh, some of what you talked about with the sustainable development goals. So the UN has produced 17 sustainable development goals that 
um, apply to every society and they're meant to be reached by 2030. And so, for example, SDG 1 is no poverty. We spoke a lot about how older adults are often no longer able to work. Um, and so they're at significant risk of facing poverty. And hopefully some of them are lucky enough to obtain these state pensions, but often even those aren't enough to cover basic necessities. So there are some gaps to fill. Uh, SDG 3 is about good health and well-being. We have a huge growth in the aging population and that puts significant pressure on our health institutions. So like Paul said, it's important to start thinking policy-wise how we can accommodate for this shifting demographic. Um, and then if we just go into SDG 10, reduced inequalities, I mean, there are inequalities based on gender, socioeconomic background, race, ethnicity, and all of those things can be compounded by ageism and uh, aging in general, which is hopefully a universal identity that all of us will face as growing older. So thank you so much. And um, let's see, we have an audience question from Deborah. She asked about uh, the rate of suicide before COVID-19. And what do you now, how the risk looks? Well, I haven't seen anything, any specific numbers or anything on that yet, but I think certainly the risk is greater uh, because uh, of the isolation and people uh, getting depressed. Um, so, you know, you have folks who may have had you know, challenging issues with isolation before, uh, maybe some mental health issues, and now they are having to shelter in place and, and have, um, you know, at times virtually no interaction. I mean, we know that with our delivery drivers that quite often that brief encounter with delivering the meal may be the only human contact they have. So I, I think there is certainly ri greater risk for it. Um, you know, there's certainly great, there's, there's great fear, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, misinformation at times, but there's great fear among a lot of our folks uh, about it because they're, you know, they, they, do, they do recognize that age and, and chronic, multiple chronic health conditions put them at, at great risk uh, of a bad outcome if they were to contract the, 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 the virus. So, um, I mean, I think that's something that, you know, we, we, we need to work to look for signs uh, of uh, depression, but I mean, I think it, I think it is a possibility, certainly a possibility. Yeah, oh, that's hard to hear. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned you're serving Seniors Connections program. Uh, it, is it possible for people to get involved by volunteering to talk with elders? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the uh, easiest way to, to get involved is to go to our website, uh, which is uh, servingseniors.org uh, forward slash COVID-19. And that has all the information about the, the specific volunteer programs for the Connections program and other volunteer opportunities uh, that we have related to, um, again, to what's going on now with it, which is around helping deliver some of the, the meals uh, to, our, to our seniors. And uh, if you sign up for that, uh, we will get you into, we, we do some training, we, we do some, some vetting uh, on the volunteers um, and, and a little bit of training, uh, you know, how to interact because it's important for the volunteers that even though they're not, you know, we're not intending for them to sort of play social worker, uh, something may come up in the course of the conversation that sets off an alarm bell and uh, so we need we want to do some training to be able to make sure that um, they, they know how to connect with the older adult to the resources that we can provide them. And, and the other thing that we're, we're, we're doing is we are connecting, you know, we are having the folks to receive the calls are opting in. And I think that's something very important and something that probably you should raise um, because there are a number of initiatives out there similar to this where they're attempting to uh, connect folks, but some of them are, are cold calling. And that gets into an issue that, that causes me some concern because uh, we spend a lot of time talking about scams and there's a lot of you know, dubious folks out there. And so if you are an older adult and you get a call from somebody who you don't know, you have not opted in, you've not let somebody say, 
note the note that you want them to call. And suddenly they're calling and asking you and, and asking questions about your life and what's going on. I would, I would say, wait a second, I don't know who you are and I would not divulge information. So it's just unfortunate that, that even now in this pandemic, in this crisis, there still are folks out there that are uh, gonna take advantage. So just, just make sure that, that if you are an older adult, make sure you, you, you wanna receive phone calls that you go through an organization like Serving Seniors or one of the others that are doing it so that you've opted in. And if you get a call that makes you feel weird or odd, you have a place to report it so that, sure that nothing, nothing bad is happening. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any more audience questions? You covered so much all at once. We really appreciate it. Terrific. Well, I've enjoyed it. Great. Have a good one. Um, and this all will be posted on the UNA USA San Diego website. And you can just look up the um, UN info sessions within that and all of them will be posted. And <laughs> she just recommended the Pulitzer nominated book, Elderhood. Have you read it? I have not. Uh, I've heard good things about it as well. So thank you for the addition, Deborah. Yeah. Have a good day.